It is through the experience of having our sins forgiven that a person truly comes to know Yahweh and build a relationship with him. I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, and reading from verse 6, and David has just expressed how blessed it is to have one's sins forgiven. And he says, For this shall every one that is chassid, godly, those in the covenant that are covered by the chesed of God, pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found, Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh to him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Verse 10. For many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in Yahweh, Chesed, shall compass him about. So, This is now a relationship that has come about through forgiveness. And God's chesed, his his loyal covenant mercy, enshrouds a person about under his protective and wonderful covering. Not from trial, but through our trials. But there's more taking place here because God interrupts in the middle of the psalm to say this in verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. In other words... Within this covenant and this relationship that we have with God through forgiveness is an education that is taking place. There's an education process taking place within this privileged covenant protective covering. Now I want to show this is the fact. Come with me to Luke chapter 1. Here we have Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and he's speaking concerning his son. In Luke chapter 1, and we read from verse 76. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people. How does he give knowledge of salvation unto his people? By... And the Greek is in the dative instrumental, which simply means that through or by the use of the remission of sins. He's going to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the use of the forgiveness of their sins. He uses their forgiveness to teach them how Verse 78, through the tender mercies of our God, through his character. We've seen all of that. But it's an education process. Whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet unto the way of peace. So this is a learning experience. We come to know God by his use of the remission of sins. 
That's what we learned in our opening study together, wasn't it? In Jeremiah 31, that the covenant was being written on their hearts through forgiveness. That's how they will come to know Yahweh. How we will become to know Yahweh. Let's have a look at another example in Psalm 25. Psalm 25 and... We begin at verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Yahweh. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. So David asked God to teach him twice here. He asked God to show him the way, to lead him, and he waits upon him to do this. You see, there's no leaning on self here, is there? Here's someone who's learned to rest upon Yahweh. It's someone who has learned through forgiveness. Verse 6. Remember, O Yahweh, thy tender mercies, notice the margin, bowels of mercies, and thy chesed, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions, according to thy chesed, remember thou me for thy compassion's sake. O Yahweh, Good and upright is Yahweh. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way, in the course of life. The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of Yahweh are chesed and truth. The way of forgiveness unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Yahweh, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that fears Yahweh? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of Yahweh is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Now, I don't know about you, but can't you just hear all the echoes all the way through this of what we've been talking about? And notice... The theme here, three times he mentions, teach in the way. He's, the wicked forsakes his own way and he now takes on the way of God. And God will teach him in that way. So who is it that he teaches in the way? Well, in verse 8, it's the sinners. In verse 9, it's the meek. In verse 12, it's those that fear Yahweh. And they're all synonymous terms. It's speaking about the same person. It's the repentant sinner. They are the meek. They are those that fear Yahweh. Verse 14, it says, The secret of Yahweh is with them that fear him. Remember Psalm 130? If thou, Yahweh, shouldst mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. We know from this psalm that those that fear Yahweh are the meek. And they are those who are repentant sinners. And the meek by very definition, are those that fear Yahweh. 
And the meek are those that are selfless, teachable, pliable, humble, accepting of God's word. They fear him because he's got the antidote. And they've come to love where that antidote is. It's him. It's in him. The meek are the humbled and repentant sinners of verse 8. Biblical meekness, brothers and sisters, is not natural. It's taught through the educating process of the forgiveness of sins. We learn to fear Yahweh. It doesn't come naturally. We learn to fear him when we realize, as Psalm 130 says, that forgiveness is with him, not in our hands. It's impossible for us, but all things are possible with him. And verse 14 continues, and he will show them his covenant. It more correctly is this way. He will make or cause them to know the covenant. He will cause them. How does he do this? Well, it's all about teaching and helping the meek, those that fear Yahweh, the repentant sinners, to come to know him by experience. The word is yoda, to know by experience. Forgiveness is a, an instrument in the hands of God of coming to know him. And through this process, he writes his law and chesed and truth on the inward parts, as we shall see as we progress. So how does this amazing education process of developing meekness work? When God sent forth messengers to, to reveal his son, what was it that was preached? The kingdom of God. Yes, but there was also a call to action. Now look carefully at what happens here. Come with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3 and in verse, verses 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, what did he preach? Well, we know from chapter 4 and in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of the mighty works were done. His mighty works were done. Because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, in verse 21. And Capernaum in verse 23. Even the works... And the miracles that Christ did from town to town were designed to bring people to repentance. And not just his works, but in his message in chapter 12. It says in, in verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And when Christ sent out the twelve apostles to, to, in twos, in Mark 6 verse 12, it says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. That was his message. This was the work of the Lord. He may have been performing miracles. He may have been preaching wonderful things about the coming kingdom and what we should be doing in our lives. 
But the very first step in this path was repentance. Everything was designed to get people to repent. That's why we've been through such a process, brothers and sisters, and gone right down there. So we realise that need. That's what he was trying to do. Get them to see that. When the apostles went out to preach the gospel after the ascension of Christ, what was their message? Come with me to Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So it's true, the first thing we need to do is believe the gospel, but what does that mean? It ought to bring us to a state of repentance. Then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. There's a twofold step here. First repent and then baptism. Now is that what we are calling on people to do when they, when they come into the truth? Or do we merely ask them a few, to learn a few doctrines and answer a few questions and if they get it right, dunk them under water and they have a ticket into the ecclesia? I'm being facetious on purpose. Or do we ask them to repent? Do we help them to understand what repentance really means? That's what John the Baptist, what Christ and the apostles taught. Repentance is the first step. Now notice the process and we go to the other end of Acts and Acts 26. Acts 26 and in verse 20. He showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and through all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Notice how repentance is the first step in a process. And it's continuous. First you are to repent. Then to turn to God. Which I believe he means to be baptized. And do the works meet for repentance. It's something that continues in works governed by a repentant heart. So repentance doesn't just happen at a certain point of time. It continues. So there's something really powerful here about repentance that affects us for the rest of our lives. So what's involved in repentance? Well, we're going to have to go back right to the other end of Acts again, to Acts chapter 3, because it just shows it very clearly in, in the English words of our AV. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. So he says there, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So repent and be converted are the two ends of the spectrum of this work of repentance. They're basically speaking of the same thing, but they use two different words, or he uses two different words to describe repentance. And there's a spectrum here. The first word is repent is metanoio. 
and that's the verb, the, the noun, metanoia, means exactly the same thing except one's a noun and one's a verb. It means to perceive afterwards in the mind, to change the mind or purpose. So it's a changing of the mind. And the word converted is epistrepho, and it means to turn, to turn again. So this process is to change our mind, our, our purpose, our thinking. Hear the echoes again. Our thoughts. And to turn our direction or course of life in the other direction. From sin to God. The idea of repentance is, is an Old Testament concept and it's built around such a small word that has such a little meaning but such powerful implications. It's the, this little word shuv or shub as some would call it. To turn. That little word turn encompasses all that repentance means because it contains all the elements that are required in this massive process to turn from evil and to turn to God. I'd like to show a couple of powerful examples of this in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith Yahweh of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith Yahweh of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith Yahweh. Now, this is very powerful. If you turn unto me, I will turn unto you. So both parties will turn. But the prerequisite is that we turn first. As soon as we turn, he will turn to us. Verse 4 is not only the, the, the need to turn to God, but they need to turn from their evil doings. It's a different course. This is not a mere recognition of God. It's, it's a total turning away from a previous way of doing things and a wholehearted turning to God and doing things his way. And he will wholeheartedly turn to us. Can you see the point there? The relationship begins there. There's a turning to each other based on us forsaking our way and turning to him in his way. That's where the relationship begins. Now here's another example of it in Joel in chapter 2. Joel 2 in verse 12, we'll begin at verse 12. And verses 12 and 13 is what God considers to be the spirit of repentance. Look at what he says. Therefore also now saith Yahweh, turn, shuv, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garment, 
and turn unto me, saith uh, uh, unto Yahweh your God. So it's a turning with all our heart, with fasting, self denial, with genuine weeping and mourning over the past way of life. It's a true recognition of what we have been and done. And he says, rend your heart and not your garment. It's not a token. This can only come, can't it, through self-examination, genuine self-examination, as we've seen. And a deep searching, not on the surface, deep down, as to who we really are. That's the language he's using, isn't it? <coughs> and then he adds four, halfway through verse 13. And this is where you're going to find that he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great chesed. And repenteth him of the evil that he intended to bring upon you. That's where you find him. That's what we've found. All of those things that he shows if we're prepared to repent. Genuinely repent. Once again it involves the turning of both parties or a changing. But it's not a matter of course because he says in verse 14, who knoweth if he will turn, shuv, and repent. This word repent here is nachem, and it's another word that just simply means to change, well, it's to change the mind concerning what he intended. It's still Yahweh's prerogative to make a change of direction in his outlook upon us. So, brothers and sisters, God must see the genuineness. It's not a token. Oh, sorry about that. And sometimes we, we know we've got to ask for forgiveness because that's what you do. And we know we've done wrong, so we say it. That's not what he's looking for. When we come and we, we examine ourselves with, with these emblems, we've seen the process. It's not just a token. It's got to be genuine. And God knows when we're being genuine. So we see the basic principles behind repentance is a process. It's the turning away from one's own way, or turning away from one's own way, and it's turning fully unto Yahweh. Now, each of those two steps of this repentance process contains sort of sub-steps. I'll show you what I mean. We're going to look, first of all, turning away from our sins. Come with me to, to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He that covers Kassar, his sins, shall not prosper. He that hides his sin shall not prosper. But whoso one confesses and two forsakes them shall have mercy. So you've got these two things here. Confession, which is the seeking of forgiveness and acknowledging, and forsaking. That's the other part of turning away from. So it's not just turning away, it's total forsaking. All right, so what's this confession? There's two words in the, uh, in the Hebrew, yoda and toda. We, we know those words elsewhere as referring to thanksgiving and praise. 
but it's also the word for confession. Because at its base, it's, it means acknowledgement. So acknowledging has the idea of confessing on the one hand, and acknowledging means appreciation on the other. You can see how even in English, it can have those two connotations. Well, it's got that in the, in the Hebrew as well. Now, the, the, the Greek also has a word that has this, this meaning as well. It's homologio. It means to speak the same thing, to assent, to agree with. So it's an agreement or an acknowledgement. It's agreeing or acknowledging that God is right and that we are wrong. That's what we've got to do. That's what confession is about, is acknowledging God is right and that we are wrong. And we're desperately in need of his mercy. Now let's have a look at Psalm 32 again, and we'll see how this, this is used. <clears throat> Psalm 32. In the beginning of the process of turning away from, from sin. We see how David felt when I kept silence. Verse 3. My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moistures turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged Yudah my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid I said I will confess Yoda my transgression unto Yahweh and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin so here's David suffering because of the depravity of what he'd done that pent up guilt raged within him, making life a terrible burden unto him. The weight of sin and sin's grip choked his thoughts and his life as, it, as he tries to hide beneath an outward show of respectability and position. He did try that, didn't he? But Nathan, when he came to him and said, Thou art the man, David immediately says, I have sinned. And immediately Nathan comes back and says, And Yahweh has forgiven thy sin. How powerful is that? It's because God knew he was genuine. It was like an offloading. Once he acknowledged once he could confess. The word acknowledged there is the same as the word confessed, as we noted in verse 5. They're both the word yuda. So we get the idea of this word. But notice also in, in verse 5, the acknowledged is paralleled with not hid. And that's that word kassar. It means to hide or to conceal. In other words, acknowledgement is bringing out into the open. It's not hiding away or denying our sins. That's what John says, isn't it? In, in 1 John 1 and verses 8 to 10, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. His word is not in us. This is the very curse of sin, is that it deceives us into thinking we're okay, that we're right. It hides and disguises itself as righteousness. It disguises itself as humility. 
It disguises itself in all sorts of forms where we justify our actions. And it produces the hideous personality traits like David had when he tried to judge that traveller that Nathan described to him. And he was right over the top, wasn't he? He shall die for eating a lamb. You see, it hides itself as part of, and it shows itself in very um, judgmental ways, and harsh. It hides itself as our unfortunate background or extenuating circumstances and so on, but it's not excusable as we've seen. It must be acknowledged, brought out into the open for what it is. So we turn to the other side now. The turning to God. What is that? Remember Acts 3 verse 19. I'll, I'll um, cite it back. He says, repent, change your mind, and be converted. Now, this is the other end of the spectrum. So, conversion, it means more than, than simply turning from a past way of life and trying to be good. It's meant to be total. We've seen that in, in Zechariah and in... Um, Job, it's total, with all our hearts. It's the turning from evil, from self. So if it's turning away from self, what it tries to do, the monstrosity that we've seen it to be, it's all self-centered. If we're turning away from self and our course of life, what's left? Well, here's what's left. In Matthew 18, Matthew 18 and beginning at verse 1, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Mark says that they had been arguing by the way as to who was being the greatest, and he asked them. They wanted to know the answer to this question because it's so important to them. This is a monstrous mountain of self. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not even enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. These were believing disciples. And they were being self-driven, full of ego, and they saw this as hierarchy and position and power and so on. And who were they looking to and listening to for all these years? Did he show that? This is what human nature is really like, isn't it? He describes the little children having the heart of a little child or the, the mind of a little child and he describes them as being little ones in verse 6. They're the meek. They're those that fear Yahweh. They're the repentant sinners. They know their need. They need to be brought to the state of a, of a defenseless, dependent, guileless child who knows its need. 
And Christ goes on to say that these little children can be easily pushed around because they're so vulnerable. You need to be very careful how you treat them, he says. So conversion then is turning from trusting self into trusting God as a little child. It's not something that can happen in a flash, is it? You can't just put that on. I'll just act like a child now. This doesn't happen like that. It's a process. It's a learning process, a learning experience. We may have been baptised, but not being converted in its fullest sense. Remember Peter in Luke 22, verse 32? He professed, I'll never forsake thee, these all might, but I never will. He was so convinced of his loyalty. But where was he operating from, brothers and sisters? Peter had faith. He believed that, that God was, was working with Messiah. He was convinced that God had, had, had put that belief in him, like Christ said of Peter. It was by his word. But Peter was human and he had, had to learn that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He was part of Messiah's work, and he wanted to show his Lord how much he appreciated that. But he had to learn that there's this huge mountain of self here. And Christ said to him, But I've prayed for thee, Peter. That thy faith fail not. Why? Why did he say that? Because that little amount of faith that he had was sitting in the midst of a mountain of self. Which when challenged can bring down the whole structure. It evaporates. And we can identify with Peter, can't we? Well, let's conclude by looking at the experience of forgiveness through David in the psalm that we had as our reading, Psalm 51. Here's a psalm written by a man whose sin is held up as an example in the Bible because of the lessons it, affer it affords us. David was a man after God's own heart. Yet that man fell. Sin lurking beneath took him and it changed his life. But the experience of forgiveness changed him. And that's what we've got to learn. And it changed him forever. So in verse 1, he says, Have graciousness upon me. Stoop down uh, uh, unto me, O God. According unto thy chesed, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, bowels of mercies, blot out my transgressions. So where has he gone? Look at that. He's gone to the very character of God where there is forgiveness. He couldn't go to the law and say, I'll do better next time. The law condemned him outright. He was in desperate need. And he does the only one thing that he can do. He asks for forgiveness on the basis of God's very character. And notice in verse 3 how he then confesses his sin. Verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. He acknowledges what he's done. It's left a deep impression on his own mind because he says it will, it, that my sin is ever before me, before my face. But it isn't just to himself that he acknowledges this. In verse 4, he acknowledges 
what he has done unto God. He may have committed his sin against Uriah, but in the end, it's only because God has made those laws as to what is right and what is wrong. Verse 4, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He acknowledges that God is totally justified in condemning him. And then he acknowledges the source of the problem in verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There's a, there's a development here because the word shapen is cool, and it means to twist, to twirl in pain and travail. It's used of, of, of childbirth. He was born in perversity, he says. And he goes further back to his conception, which involved his father. His conception is described as being in sin. And he couldn't mean that it was illegitimate because he was the youngest in his family. He's acknowledging that he has a nature from which sin has arisen. So that his mother and his father had this same problem and so did their parents and they theirs. He's speaking about this bias within our nature but also the environment that this brings on from generation to generation. We are all both victims and agents of sin. He's been shaped by something far greater than he can deal with. He's not excusing himself. He's acknowledging the problem. And so David acknowledges the depravity of sin in every sphere. And in verse 6 he says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Here's the writing of, of Yahweh's law on the inward parts through forgiveness. He's acknowledging that Yahweh desires truth, ameth, not outwardly performed, but inwardly empowering his actions. It's not something that comes naturally, but through his experience, God, he says, shall make or cause me to know wisdom. He can learn from this. Out of it, God can give him, in verse 10, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within him, a cleansed conscience. Now, what kind of spirit is this? Well, it's not anything to do with self, because he can't do it himself. He's not saying, well, I'll, 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 I'll try better next time. I've just got to get in control of this. Because the whole psalm says, verse 1, You blot out my transgressions. Verse 7, You purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. You wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 8, You make me to hear joy and gladness. Verse 9, You hide thy face from my sins, and you blot out mine iniquities. Verse 10, You create in me a clean heart. O God, and you renew a right spirit in me. Verse 11, you cast me not away from thy presence and you take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, you restore me, you uphold me. Verse verse 14, you deliver me. And verse 15, you, O Lord, open thou my lips. He's saying, God, you have to do all this. I can't do anything. Because it's brought him to a place, brothers and sisters, where he's recognised this. This is true repentance. It's realising this. Acknowledging this. That it's impossible for me. But all things are possible with God. And, And 
What is it that, that we can bring to the table? What was it that the Jews could bring? They, they could not come before the altar empty, it says. What could they bring? Well, all the offerings represented God's offering to them. Well, they could bring thanksgiving, we're told. Because that offering could be either male or female. It didn't really matter what it was. And it could have blemishes. The only offering that could. So they could offer that. Well, you just look at this. He says in verse 14, Deliver me from, you know, you deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. It's God that brings that out of us too. Thanksgiving is a response to something given. But it's just wrung out of the heart as far as what God has done for us. It's not an act of greatness. It's just brought out as a natural response for what God has done. That's what this is on the table. What it ought to bring in us. Well, here's the one thing we can bring. It's in verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desire, delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Now look at this. Look at the grievous sins that David had committed. No outward keeping of a commandment, no religious act, no going through some ceremony, even eating bread and drinking wine is going to give forgiveness. It can't put it right. But David knows he will not be despised. How does he know that? Because he knows that Yahweh's looking for this. It's faith in who Yahweh is and what he's promised. David has been crushed, he's right down there. Because of the realization of what he had done and who he is before his God. God wants the heart of the person, brothers and sisters, who can see who he is before his God. And can see in faith that God is the only one that can deliver him. This is the fear of Yahweh. This is meekness. There's something wonderful in this. Can you see what's happening here? I said this is the conclusion. We've got to go to one other passage and that's where we'll end. It's in Isaiah 57. Here's what's happening. Verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, the ad, the beyond, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now here's the power of the universe. Totally holy. Totally separate. There is no one like him. And he, he inhabits eternity. He's so far above everything else, he has to humble himself to even look on the heavens. But he says, he dwells with him. 
that is of a contrite and humble spirit. What does that mean? So God dwells with the person who is crushed, the person that has owned and confessed his or her sins. This person is converted. It's the converted sinner. It's the meek. It's those that fear Yahweh. If God is so high, and he dwells in the high and loftiest of places, well, that's where those that are crushed and weighed down there are, is what he's saying. It's not the spirit of Matthew 18, verse 1, as to who's going to be the greatest, who's done the most acts in the ecclesia, the most number of talks, or done the most service, or whatever else we do to boost up our own self to make us feel as if we're somebody. It's with this heart. That's where our relationship begins. There it is. Verse 16, he says, For I will not contend forever, neither will I be, uh, will I be always wrath. For the Spirit should fail before me, and the souls which I have made, for the iniquity of his covetousness was I wrath and smote him. I, I hid me and was wrath, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. That's the way, the course of self, his own heart. Well, we've seen what that's like. But verse 18, he says, I have seen his ways, but it should be, I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourning ones, the repentant ones, this high and holy one will come to the crushed heart and he'll heal it. And what's more, brothers and sisters, verse 19, this is what Yahweh is accomplishing in a a person through the forgiveness of sins. I create the fruit of the lips. That's what David had said. I will put that there. I create this new heart in a person. And he goes on to say, Peace, peace to him that is afar off, and to him that is near, saith Yahweh, and I will heal him. It's the forgiveness of sins. It it creates this humbled and crushed mind, and the fruit of the lips come bursting forth, because he has brought peace, peace to that heart. It's like that woman who was a sinner for those that heard that study. It's incredible, brothers and sisters, what God is doing when we're converted. When we go through this this extremely humbling process of bringing ourselves right down there. Not ourselves, not bringing ourselves, but let the word of God doing that. And then we are lifted up. That's what James says. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. We've got to go through this process of mourning and turning from it to sorrow. And he says, he will lift us up. Now we come to the emblems. I want you to notice at the end of verse 15 that Yahweh says, it says that Yahweh revives the spirit of the humble. Or low one, singular. And to revive the heart of the contrite or crushed ones, plural. This is the Lord Jesus Christ and all those in him who are of the same spirit. This is the one whom, through whom Yahweh cried, Come unto me, and all ye that labour and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn 
of me. It's a learning experience in Christ. And what do we find he's like? For I am meek and lowly of heart. Here's a man, brothers and sisters, who had meekness and a crushed heart. He had learned this without ever having sinned. As a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And he was heard in that he feared. It says in Hebrews. So as we eat bread, representing his body, a body shared with us, as we drink the cup of wine, representing his blood, his life poured out unto death for the many, he wants us, as we partake of it, to imbibe his spirit. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Is this not a wonder, brothers and sisters?